we're going to pull up the lecture notes here, and we're gonna finish up with acids and bases. So, okay. So just a quick review with acids and bases. Keep in mind, I want you to think of an acid as a proton donor. What is a proton? Well, I'll tell you what a proton is. A proton is going to be a hydrogen ion. So we call it a proton. That's what a proton is. So acids are proton donors, which means if you've got a beaker of water and you pour some acid into it, that acid will disassociate, okay? And it'll split off into a hydrogen ion and an anion. And so the stronger the acid, the easier it is for it to disassociate. The weaker the acid, the less likely it is to disassociate. So bases are the opposite. I shouldn't say the opposite are different in regards that I want you to think of them as proton sponges, or we call those proton acceptors. So when you add a base to a solution, it's gonna go around and look for any free floating protons or hydrogen ions, okay? And it's gonna gobble them up. So it'll decrease the amount of free hydrogen ions floating or protons floating around in a solution. So we have to figure out a way to measure this type of thing. So when we have a solution and we want to tell you, well, if it's an acid or a base or if it's a strong acid or a weak acid, we came up, all right, well, not me, but a scientist came up with a way to measure it and they call it the pH scale. And so basically our pH scale, when we're talking about pH, that's how we're able to measure right, our hydrogen ions or the protons in a solution. And it'll tell you pretty much how much is present. And so we've set that scale with the values of zero all the way to 14. So the low end of the scale is zero, the high end of the scale is 14. And so right in the middle of our scale is what we consider to be neutral. Really it's not, it's neither an acid nor a base. And so that is neutral and we give that value of neutrality a seven. So actually the pH of plain water is neutral, it's seven. And it's because, remember last class when I was talking about this, when water disassociates, it makes equal parts of hydrogen ions or protons with a plus one charge, and it makes equal parts of the hydroxide ions, which has a negative. So because it makes, out, it makes equal parts, then we consider it to be neutral. So there's a concept here that you need to really understand. And that concept is that the pH value and the hydrogen ion or the proton concentration are inversely related. What does that mean? Well, if one increases, the other one has to decrease. So if you go down here, okay, if we increase the hydrogen ion concentration, then the pH value for that solution will decrease and vice versa. If we decrease the hydrogen ion concentration, then our pH value increases. It's that simple. That's an inverse relationship. One goes up, the other goes down. So if two things are inversely related, that's what that you'll know what that means. Okay, so one more time, if we increase the hydrogen ion concentration, right, we will decrease the pH value and vice versa. So when we're looking at the scale, right, always keep in mind when we're talking about water, it's a neutral uh, value and the neutral value is a pH of seven. So anytime we have a solution, right, that has equal concentrations of both hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions, it's considered to be neutral. 
So if I have 10 hydrogen ions and 10 hydroxide ions, it's neutral. If I've got 20 hydrogen ions and two hydroxide ions, then it is going to be acidic. So solutions with a greater hydrogen ion concentration and the hydroxide ion concentration right, will be acidic. And so they'll have a pH value below seven, less than seven. One, two, four, six, any of those numbers. Three and five also, okay? So low numbers, acidic. Now, solutions that have more hydroxide ions than our hydrogen ions, those are going to be basic. We also call it alkaline. So they'll have a high pH value. So anything greater than seven, eight, nine, 10, 12, 14. Right? So bases have a high pH value, acids have a low pH value, or a value less than seven for acids, and bases have a value greater than seven. So when we move, from one number to the next, the example below says, as we go from the pH value of six to the pH value of pure water, which is seven, we're going to see that the solution that has a pH value of six has 10 times more hydrogen ions in it than pure water. Okay, so it's a power of 10 every time we go from one number to the next. <clears throat> so we refer to that as a tenfold change. So this slide here, I love. I love it, love it, love it, because it shows you in picture form what the heck it is that I'm talking about. So here's our beaker. And you can see when you look at both the beakers that the beaker on the top has a lot of hydrogen ions floating around. And the beaker on the bottom has only a few. So when we go over to the pH scale over here to look at the pH values, you'll notice that the lower pH values, one, two, three, four, five, six, are all here on the top part of the page. And those pH values, we're going to see more hydrogen ions floating around in our solution than the hydroxide ions. So again, here's that inverse relationship. Increasing hydrogen ion concentration, we'll see a decreasing pH value. And so you can see hydrochloric acid, pretty low. Stomach acids between two and three pH, that's pretty good. Actually, believe it or not, you have cells in your, um, in your stomach that produce hydrochloric acid. And we need that because that hydrochloric acid helps to activate certain enzymes. That's the fun stuff that you get to learn about when you get to chapter 26 in digestion. You notice that right here in the middle of our table, neutral value is seven, and that's going to be our pure water. And then as we get down to that bottom beaker there, where there's only a few hydrogen ions floating around, you'll see that the pH values are going to be larger than seven, eight, nine, 10, 12, 14. So that means that there's going to be less hydrogen ions than the hydroxide ions floating around. And so here's our inverse relationship. Decreasing the hydrogen ion concentration, we're going to increase our pH value. Question, is milk from different animals having different pHs? That's a great question. Well, yeah, it definitely will. Part of it, it depends on the... Um, um, the diet of those animals. And we see it quite often uh, with nursing mothers, believe it or not. So you can have animals of the same species, okay? So nursing mothers, that if, depending on what their diet consists of, the pH of the milk that they're producing can be different. So why do people wanna drink alkaline water? What's with that fad? <laughs> alkaline water, that's an interesting one. Um, believe it or not, and I'm going to get into this in a moment, your, the, your blood, okay, um, has a certain pH value. The ideal number 
for your blood's pH should be 7.4. There's a range for it, 7.35 to 7.45. But you want to keep it in that value. That is going to be alkaline, a little bit on the basic side. So in situations like that, if they're going to drink alkaline water, because in general, in general, right, here in the Western civilization, because of our diets and whatnot, we have a tendency to have more of an acidic lifestyle, they call it. So foods, drinks, products that you take into your body are going to try to drive down your pH. But your body is going to fight like heck to keep that pH of your blood within that 7.35 to 7.45. So the alkaline water just helps with that. It's one less thing that your body has to deal with. Yeah, I mean, there's studies on that. Uh, no, 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 that's great. It's a great point. Um, there has not been anything conclusive, at least that I've come across when dealing uh, with the uh, ideal pH of cancer, whether a, a certain pH value is better or worse for cancer. I mean, cancer is pretty tricky because um, those, uh, those cells uh, will grow at an uncontrollable rate for the most part. And so um, they're trying to figure out, all right, well, what is going to um, hinder that uh, out of control cell growth? So there's still nothing conclusive, Tanya. So I have not heard anything about that. Um, but again, your body, and we'll talk about it with the buffering system here, does a pretty good job on trying to maintain those certain values there. Which brings me to, that's a great lead in to the last concept here of acids and bases, neutralization and buffers, okay? Neutralization is what happens after the fact. Buffers happens, all right, in present time. And I'll, and I'll explain to you what I mean by that. So when we talk about neutralization, if you look at the term, neutral is in the word. So basically what we're trying to do is we have a solution that's become either too acidic or too basic, and our goal is to get it or return it back to that neutral pH of seven. So if we have a solution that has become too acidic, then we just add a base to it. And you do that when you have an upset stomach and you take Tums, right? Tums is going to be a bunch of basic or alkaline ingredients that are going to help to neutralize the stomach acid to get it back under control. And vice versa, bases are neutralized by adding an acid. And all this is done in order to return the pH of whatever our solution is back to neutral, hence neutralization. Um, yes, you can. Um, and, and it depends on what you want to, uh, which pH you want to measure. If you want to measure your urine pH, that's easy. You can do a dipstick test for that. I do that quite often in my office. Um, and you can also, when they take your blood, okay, if you're um, going to have some blood tests done, they will look to see what the pH value is of your blood. So depending on what you want to check, you want to check your blood pH. We got to do a blood draw. If you want to do a urine pH, just kind of see um, what your kidneys are doing. I have heard that. Do different blood types carry a different pH? Yes, but, but keep in mind, all right, it all has to be in that normal range, that 7.35 to 7.45. Okay, they might vary slightly. You might have one blood type that is a little bit more um, um, towards the low end of that value or towards the high end of that value. Okay. So buffers, now, in order to avoid the changing uh, of our blood's pH, here are the values, 7.35, 7.45. Our set point is 7.4. Thank you. Okay, 7.4. So these buffers are going to be preventative. So they're going to try to prevent the pH 
from swinging outside of that normal value. This happens all of the time, all of the time. So we'll have these buffers and what, they'll jo what their job is to do is to either accept hydrogen ions when they become in excess or they will donate those hydrogen ions, okay? That's it, They're real simple. So the two that you'll talk about in other chapters are gonna be carbonic acid, right? And it's weak for a reason and bicarbonate, which is a weak base. And both of these are weak for a reason because if they were strong acids and strong bases, let me ask you this. Do you think that it would feel good having strong acids flowing through your blood and into your tissues? Hydrochloric acid, an acid that's strong enough to eat through the top of your desk, I think that would feel pretty good. Heck no, it wouldn't feel good. Okay, so that's why they're weak. Yeah, it would definitely irritate our body and cause damage to our tissues. Low pHs, things that are acidic, are going to cause what's called denaturation. And denaturation is basically what will cause our proteins to start to break down. And when our proteins break down, and I'm gonna show you here in a moment all the functions of proteins, but when our proteins start to break down, bad things happen, very bad things will happen. So these buffers are here to prevent that. They're going to prevent denaturation. All right, so there's a question here. What is the general relationship of hydrogen ion concentration and pH? We just talked about it. Feel free to type your answer into your chat bar, okay? Remember what I said. There's a special type of relationship between, okay, your hydrogen ion concentration and the pH value for that solution that we're looking at. What was that special or that general relationship that we were talking about? Feel free to type it in. It's a good way to learn. Okay, I'm gonna push this magic button on my keyboard and see if only two of you who answered got the three, yay. All right, if you got it correct. So with the greater hydrogen ion concentration, the pH goes down and vice versa. All right, basically I'm talking about that inverse relationship. You are very right. Very, very right. So that's what we're talking about. So would you say different blood types should have different diets to help stay within a range? No, 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 I'm telling you, there's nothing wrong with that. And there's actually a belief in that, that certain blood types should eat in a certain way. Um, and I haven't done as much research into that. I've done just a, a very slight amount uh, as to regards to that, that certain blood types uh, prefer, will actually perform better with a, at a different pH. Um, so there is that belief, but again, what we're dealing with, no worries, David, I'm glad you're back. Um, what we're dealing with is we just, we just don't have enough research in regards to that question about the blood types here. So Tanya, when you talk, we talk about the different uh, blood types and the pHs and what they should be eating and whatnot, because I've had patients tell, uh, that told me that because of their blood type, they eat a lot of fish and whatnot. Um, I would say right now, there's not enough conclusive evidence. So we're still researching that. That's where that scientific method comes into play. All right, acids and bases are done. All right, let's wipe our foreheads because we're moving in to the fun stuff. Not that acids and bases and molecules aren't fun, but now we're gonna grow in size a little bit. We're gonna study biological macromolecules. So we talked about small molecules, right? The different elements. But now we're gonna grow up and talk about some of the bigger molecules, right? So we're gonna talk about these large organic molecules that are gonna be made by our own bodies. And so we need to understand that because again, it'll help us to understand the physiology, which will in turn help us to understand the anatomy a little bit more. 
So these biological molecules will have three simple ingredients in all of them. That's gonna be carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Always will have those three in these macromolecules. And some, not all, will have some nitrogen, some phosphorus, or they can have some sulfur, okay? But all of them have to have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And we talked about it last class a little bit about those carbon skeletons. Remember, we could have a chain skeleton, or we could have a branched skeleton, or we could have a ring structure. So these carbon skeletons will have several different forms that we talked about last class. So in, when we're looking at these carbon skeletons, if we see that the only elements that are in the carbon skeleton, if they're only going to have carbon and hydrogen, then we call those hydrocarbons, like the word suggests, hydro, hydrogen, and carbon, carbon. So hydrocarbons, that means that those elements, those molecules only have carbon and hydrogen inside, okay? So there's another, uh, um, <laughs> there's another uh, term that I need to address. Thank you. And we call that functional groups. Now these functional groups will be attached onto our, our carbon skeleton somewhere. And they'll do certain things. Like some of them will act like an acid. Some of them will act like a base. Most will provide polarity, all right, to our molecule. And then hydrogen bonds are bonds, all right, that will allow us to have some decent to, uh, uh, um, connection of molecules to different molecules. It allows for interaction. So these functional groups play a lot of different roles. So we're going to come back and revisit the acids and the bases, but the, the functional group that'll act like an acid, we call that a carboxyl group. And then the functional group that acts like a base, we call that an amine group, because that amine group has nitrogen and some hydrogen attached to it. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. So let's talk about our very own and our very first type of macromolecule. Lipids, some of the, you may know them as fats, okay? But lipids, all right, have two qualities to them. Well, they have several qualities, but two that are important to me. One is they're water insoluble. We talked about that before. If you're boiling water and you pour some olive oil into that boiling water and it doesn't dissolve, doesn't separate, it stays right there floating on top, that means it's not dissolving into that water solution, so it's water insoluble. They don't intermingle with one another, okay? Basically, oil is a fat that is liquid at room temperature. That's basic, I'll talk more about that. All right, so we have some functions to memorize here for our lipids. Okay, the first one is, Lipids can act as stored energy. Your body loves fat. It really does. That's why, you know, you start to put on a lot of fat because your body loves it if you're not, it wants to save it for a rainy day. Fat is actually uh, 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 rich in energy, okay? But because of our um, survival, genetic coding and whatnot, our body is still in the habit that after meals, that if you don't utilize immediately all of the macromolecules that you've ingested, then it says, all right, I'm going to try to save as much as I can for a later day, because I don't know when the next meal's coming. I have no idea. So it's going to convert a lot of those macromolecules into lipids and store them as fat. Okay. Uh, another uh, function of lipids is going to be for the cellular membrane components, all right? Now, we haven't talked about what the plasma membrane is. That's that, uh, a sur that envelope that surrounds a cell, all right? We call that the plasma membrane. Well, a significant amount of the ingredients in the plasma membrane is going to be lipids. 
And then of course, we're gonna use lipids to help make some chemical messengers in our body that we call hormones. So there's four classes, triglycerides, phospholipids, steroids, and eicosanoids. We're gonna look a little bit closer at all of these in a little bit more detail. So the triglycerides, all right, are going to be what I was talking about before, that rainy day energy source, or what we call long-term energy storage. So when your body, all right, is starting to process what you've eaten and your energy levels aren't very high at that point, but yet your body's thinking, well, you're probably gonna wanna use this later on, so I'm just gonna store it away. And that's what happens. It forms these triglycerides. And basically what a triglyceride is, I'll show you here in the next slide, is it has this glycerol backbone. I'm gonna represent it with this rectangle here. And then it has three fatty acid chains attached to it. Okay. So these fatty acid chains are basically a bunch of hydrogens or a bunch of carbons attached to each other. And then off of those carbons, you'll see a lot of hydrogens hanging off of it, right? And they can vary in length. You can have short chain fatty acids, medium chain fatty acids, long chain fatty acids. And in between some of the carbons, you could have a, a double bond. Remember those are covalent bonds. Most of them will have single covalent bonds, but in some situations we'll have double bonds. Well, in a fatty acid that does not have any double bonds, we call it a saturated fatty acid. Right? If you see at least one double bond, it's unsaturated. And if there's two or more, then it's polyunsaturated, poly meaning many. Okay, so keep in mind, all right, this type of fat, the triglycerides, is going to be for energy storage, and it's the most common form of energy storage lipid. And the tissue that you'll store these triglycerides in are going to be called adipose tissue. And adipose tissue, the predominant cell type, we'll talk about it today, um, it's called an adipocyte. But adipose tissue has um, other functions other than energy storage. We also use it for structural support, cushioning, and insulation. Well, what does that mean? Well, if you dissect the human cadaver and you're trying to get at the kidneys, you'll notice that the kidneys are packed in fat. It's called perirenal fat. And that fat will act as a cushion to the kidneys. And so not just the kidneys, but other organs in your body, your intestines, all right? A lot of the internal organs will have fat surrounding them to offer cushioning. Also insulation, fat acts as a wonderful insulator. I know from personal experience, because a good friend of mine and I decided to go jump in a lake up in New York in the middle of November, snow on the ground. And I jumped in and immediately got out, maybe spent five, 10 seconds there. He weighs almost twice the amount as I do. And so he had a little bit, or actually a quite a, a, a lot more uh, um, fat on him. And so though that adipose tissue offered him insulation. So when we are going to store all right, these triglycerides in, the, in, in our adipose tissue, the process of that creation of that tissue is called lipogenesis. Lipo is going to stand for the fat or the lipids. Genesis is to create or make. So when we are trying to form these triglycerides, when we have plenty of energy, but our energy requirements are very low or non-existent, like if you're going to go sit down after dinner and watch um, NCIS or The Bachelor, okay, your energy requirements are very low. So you have lots of energy because you just ate. So your body's going to be like, all right, time to save this stuff for a rainy day. And so it is going to form, all right, the adipose tissue lipids through the process of lipogenesis. Now, 
it's time for you to go run that 5K you forgot about. And so you wake up in the morning and you have decided, all right, um, I'm, let me get ready. Let's start running this race. You do your stretching, you get on the, 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 um, the line there and then the gun goes off and you start running, all right? I won't get into the whole metabolism, but let's just say for pretend, all right, you don't have, uh, you've used up all your, your blood sugar, uh, all the blood glucose there. So your body is now going to start to break down the stored fat in the adipose tissues. And so when it breaks down those triglycerides, we call that lipolysis. Again, lipo is going to be the fat. Lysis is to break or break down. So when your body needs those triglycerides, okay, for the energy that they have, it'll start to break them down and we call that lipolysis. That's what this picture is showing us here. Here's our triglyceride down here. The purp uh, purple, that pink kind of box there, that represents the glycerol group. And then you can see we have fatty acid chains hanging off. There's three of them. Okay, so we have this in our adipose tissue stored. Well, now you need it because all of a sudden you have a high amount of energy requirements going on. So you're going to undergo that process of lipolysis. And what you're going to do is you're going to start snapping off all right, these fatty acid groups off of the glycerol group here. You just break them off. And then we'll start to break down the fatty acids one by one. We'll just start breaking these bonds. Okay, we're not going to talk about that. That's uh, chapter 27. Okay, so that's what we're seeing here. So we release the triglycerides. We start to break them down. We start to break down the fatty acids. We bust the fatty acids off of the glycerol groups here. Now you just had that uh, meal and it's time to store, all right, uh, the, the, the triglycerides because your energy requirements are nothing, then we're going to undergo lipogenesis. And we're going to start forming these uh, triglyceride groups and storing them inside of your adipose tissue. Okay, the next type of lipid is the phospholipids. These guys look similar to a triglyceride, except Okay, instead of having three fatty acids hang off of the uh, glycerol group, we only have two. Okay, but our phospholipids make up a part of that chemical barrier of the plasma membrane. They're a huge component. And phospholipids are an amphipathic molecule, which means part of that molecule is polar, and another part of that molecule is nonpolar, All right? So the end that has the glycerol group, okay? And it has a phosphate attached onto that glycerol group. We call that the head. And so that group is polar because of the components of the head of the phospholipid, the glycerol phosphate and the organic groups there. So that's the polar part of our phospholipid. So if we're gonna draw our phospholipid, it will look like this. We have a circular round head like that, and it'll have two fatty acid tails hanging off, like that. The fatty acid group is nonpolar. So remember what I said, Non-polar are water insoluble, will not dissolve in water, okay? So that makes them hydrophobic, water-fearing. So the tails are hydrophobic, water-fearing. The head is hydrophilic, okay, water-loving, because it has the polar group there. Polar molecules will dissolve into, they're, they're water soluble. All right, the third type of lipid are the steroids, okay? Steroids are gonna be ringed structures made up of hydrocarbons. There's four rings 
in a steroid. The first three have six carbons in their rings, and then the last one has five carbons. Now, these rings, okay, will have what we call side chains that hang off of them. And depending on what that side chain is, is going to determine what type of steroid we have. For example, cholesterol, right? This is a huge component to the plasma membrane of our cells. It's huge. In fact, cholesterol adds stability to your plasma membrane in temperature extremes. So if the temperature uh, changes to one extreme or the other, cholesterol helps to stabilize that plasma membrane. It protects it. So it's actually good. I encourage people to take in moderate amounts of cholesterol. Your body will make its own also, okay? But sometimes if the body's not making enough, it's okay to take it in through the diet. Well, we need cholesterol not only for our plasma membranes, but to make certain types of hormones, okay? Our steroid hormones, testosterone, estrogen, right? So that's important there. And then you won't talk about it here, but bile salts. Okay, it is a very important ingredient for bile salts because we need bile salts. Bile salts are made in the liver, stored in the gallbladder, and they help to emulsify fat. But well, what does that mean? It helps to break down fat. So when you're breaking fat down, all right, if you eat a fatty meal, let's say, all right, your gallbladder will start to contract and it'll release the bile and it'll empty it into the small intestine so it can help break down the fats. If you don't have a gallbladder, all right, you can still make bile. The liver makes the bile, right? But it doesn't have any way of, of storing it. So you might not produce enough bile if you have an exceptionally fat, large fatty meal. So what, the, what does that mean? Well, some of you already know what it is because you might not have a gallbladder, but I'll tell you uh, folks that don't. That means that you're gonna go to the bathroom within 30 to 40 minutes after that fatty meal. I had to travel with a friend of mine for six hours from New York City, or from upstate New York to New York City. And we made the mistake of getting some breakfast biscuits. And so we had to stop a couple of times on the way. All right, the last type of lipid are the eicosanoids. A nickname for these are locally acting hormones or local signaling molecules. But basically that's what they are. They're local hormones made by the cells themselves, okay? And so they all come from this uh, molecule right here, erysidonic acid, which is in every single plasma membrane in your body. So if that plasma membrane gets damaged, then erysidonic acid starts to undergo some chemical um, changes. And so what will happen as a result of that, we will initiate the inflammatory response. So when there's cell damage, the inflammatory response occurs. And during this inflammatory response, the inflammatory response is basically a whole series of chemical reactions that will occur. And as a result, all right, depending on how far down through all these chemical reactions we go, we can get these different types of acosinoids, prostaglandins, prostacyclines, uh, thromboxanes, and leukotrienes. So when these eicosanoids are made through the inflammatory cascade or the inflammatory response, you'll get swelling, inflammation, pain, certain uh, types of symptoms will occur. So we've made drugs that help to block the creation of these eicosanoids. You've heard of COX-1, COX-2 inhibitors. COX is a specific type of enzyme that's involved in the inflammatory response. So if we are able to stop that enzyme from working, then we're gonna stop that chemical equation or that chemical reaction from occurring. And so we can decrease the inflammatory response. Steroids are awesome because erysidonic acid will break down into a different type all right, of molecule. We'll call it molecule X. 
And there's a certain enzyme that will work on it here. Well, steroids, I'm just gonna put an ST here, will knock out that enzyme, boom, at the source. And it prevents the inflammatory response from getting too out of hand. That's why steroids are wonderful. They are absolutely wonderful for um, trying to de for decreasing inflammation. So people in a car accident, or if they pull the muscle real bad and they get uh, some pretty bad swelling, the steroids will help to reduce that significantly. So you've heard of these terms, saturated, unsaturated, and trans fats. In fact, trans fats have been outlawed in New York City. You cannot go to a restaurant that utilizes or uses trans fats in any of its cooking. But when we're talking about the different types of fats, most animal fats are going to be saturated, which means there are no double bonds in those molecules. Okay, So at room temperature, these saturated fats are going to be solid. Now, most of our vegetable fats, they're going to be unsaturated. And again, at room temperature, they'll be liquid. So we usually refer to them as oils, right? Olive oil, coconut oil, okay, flaxseed oil. They're considered to be healthier. But we can convert these into saturated fats through the process of hydrogenation. And unfortunately, if we don't complete the hydrogenation process or we stop in the middle when, in, in which we get like a, a partial hydrogenation, that's when we get these bad boys, trans fats. They taste good, but they are bad for you. Why are the saturated fats unhealthy for you? Um, the big part is, the saturated fats are going to be unhealthy because they're more closely associated with plaque buildup. Whereas the vegetable fats, because they're going to be in a, at a liquid um, uh, temperature, right, they're less likely to congeal or solidify to become solid once it's inside your body. But we have found when they've done studies and done the research there that a lot of the times when we're looking at the plaque buildup, a lot of that has come from the saturated fats versus the unsaturated fats. That's why they consider it to be unhealthy. But again, here's the thing. There's a lot more at stake here, and I won't go into it. I could, but I won't, all right? But when we talk about plaque buildup, which you've heard of, you know, atherosclerosis, yeah, I can't talk today, atherosclerosis, okay, um, which is that plaque in the arteries, that always occurs when there's some sort of physical injury to the blood vessel. You have to have some sort of physical injury to that blood vessel for atherosclerosis to occur. Once that happens, then we can start to get the plaque buildup. So there's a lot of, of um, uh, physicians out there that encourage patients to have what we call an anti-inflammatory diet. Basically, don't eat things that are going to cause inflammation, swelling. It can lead to a condition called leaky gut syndrome. Again, um, I don't want to take up too much of your time about it, but you can Google it and uh, do some research and see, okay? So they really encourage you to basically eat an anti-inflammatory diet, which is basically healthy. Okay, don't eat processed garbage. Right? I'm not judging because I like Five Guys Burger as much as the next person. All right, in fact, I had one Friday night. But my point being is, you know, you want to stay away from processed food. Right, you want to enjoy. I know they're good. I get the big one. It's over. It's almost. It's 1,100 calories. The burger that I get. That's not good because I count my calories, except I didn't count my calories that night. Okay. So a couple other of the lipids that are available, we got our glycolipids. Those are basically lipids with a nice carbohydrate attached to it. And we utilize these lipids for cellular binding. We have to connect cells to one another. And we need that, especially in immune cells. When immune cells are going around and surveilling everything to make sure that the cells 
are that are present are good cells or if they're bad cells, if it's an infected cell or a non-infected cell. So these white blood cells need to bind onto these cells and give them the look the once over. We gotta look you over, make sure you're okay. So we'll see these types of lipids on our plasma membrane here. And then you'll see our fat soluble vitamins. We're missing one. Vitamins A, E, and K. Vitamin D is not here. And I leave it out purposefully because vitamin D has also been classified or categorized as a pro-hormone. But I'll mention here, okay, until it's officially not considered a fat-soluble vitamin, I will still include it. Okay, fat-soluble vitamins can actually be stored in your adipose tissue. So if you have too much, you could get toxic levels. Water-soluble vitamins, you end up just kind of pretty much peeing them out. So which class of lipids forms the cell membranes? I'll even make it a multiple choice uh, question for you. Okay, multiple choice question for you. Let's see if I can type the answer choices here. All right, so answer choice A is going to be triglycerides. All right, answer choice B is gonna be phospholip, whoops. Lipids. Answer choice C is going to be steroids. And then answer choice D will be eicosanoids. Okay, so put in your answer now. But, well, I know, I know I didn't spell triglycerides correctly, but you know what I mean. Triglycerides, phospholipid steroids, or acosanoids, which ones form the cell membrane? We got eight answers. Here we go. B, love it, love it. You folks are going to rock. B, 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 yes. Good, good, good. Great job, everybody. Great job. Okay. So done with the lipids. Done with the lipids. Let's get into the next class here which are carbohydrates, the sugars, carbohydrates. So when we are talking about carbohydrates, remember those three uh, molecules that I told you about, we're, we're revisiting them right now, okay? Those macromolecules, hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. So the chemical formula, when we're dealing with carbohydrates, okay, every single carbon is either gonna have a hydrogen ion okay, attached to it. And it'll also have, all right, OH, the hydroxide uh, molecule, uh, oxygen and hydrogen attached to it, okay? So we give it a chemical formula of CH2 oxygen. That's awful, I hate when it does that, with the N on the outside. N is talking about the number of atoms. So let's talk about glucose. Glucose is our famous molecule. It has six carbons. So the chemical formula or the molecular formula for glucose is going to be C6. H, there's a two over there. So we're going to multiply the number of carbons by that two. So that'll be H12. And then oxygen, six. So that's the chemical formula for glucose. C6, H12, O6. Also the chemical formula for fructose and also the chemical formula for galactose. Because remember, galactose and fructose are isomers. They have the same molecular formula, but their structural formula is different. They're arranged differently, so they can have different properties. So there's three types of carbohydrates, monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. The monosaccharides, mono, is a simple sugar. Okay. And so there's three types of the simple sugars. We'll talk about that here in a moment. Disaccharides is when we take two monosaccharides, two simple sugars, and we stick them together. Now we have a disaccharide. And then polysaccharide is when we make a big long chain of monosaccharides. We just string them along. And we keep, keep like a, a chain there, just keep adding links to it. Well, in this case, we're going to keep adding all right, are monomers. And a monomer is a single unit. That's what a monomer stands for. 
So speaking of carbohydrates, let's talk about the famous carbohydrate of glucose. It is a six carbon carbohydrate, which means, all right, it will have, this has a, a hexose ring to it, okay? But it is the most common simple sugar and your cells love it. In fact, it is considered to be the primary, the most sought after nutrients, all right, that's going to supply energy to our cells. So it's very important that we maintain the proper levels in our body. You've heard the term blood sugar levels. People that have an issue with diabetes, all right, are always monitoring their blood sugar levels. So it has to be carefully maintained in the body Right, because guess what? The number one organ that gets first dibs on glucose, no matter what, is going to be the brain. The brain is so special that it doesn't even need insulin to absorb glucose into its cells. It doesn't need insulin. All right, other tissues, other cells do. Insulin can't get in, or excuse me, glucose can't get in without insulin. Right? Brain doesn't need that. That's how special it is. So when it's time you've had a meal and whatnot, and you've restored all the energy to all your cells, and you have a lot of ex extra leftover glucose, your body's going to do what your body wants to do. And it's going to want to say, hey, I'm going to save this glucose that's in my blood right now for a rainy day. So it's going to store it. And there's only two, two organs that can store glucose, the liver and skeletal muscle. Test question right there, liver, skeletal muscle. So it takes that extra glucose, all right? And this is what it's gonna do. It's gonna start making a long string of individual glucose molecules, those monomers, and it's going to just keep attaching one to another, to another, to another. And it makes a big, long string. And that process is called glycogenesis. Glyco is the formation of glycogen. What is glycogen? It's the stored form of glucose. But in a big, long chain. So glyco is for the glycogen, genesis is to make. You're making glycogen. So now comes the time where we need to get access to that glycogen. So you had dinner tonight, we'll pretend, at 6 o'clock. And so it's bedtime. 9, 10 o'clock comes around, you're going to bed. And so in the middle of the night, around three, four in the morning, five in the morning, your blood sugar levels drop significantly because all while you were sleeping, all of your cells were still doing what they do, right? They still got to make proteins. Your body still needs to, to make certain chemicals, certain physiological functions go on 24 seven, right? And it takes energy to do that stuff. So during that time, you have burnt through all of that blood sugar or that blood glucose. And so now we need to replace it. So the liver is going to break down the glycogen through the chemical, yeah, the chemical process of hydrolyzation. So it's gonna to start to cut off Parts of the glycogen, individual glucose molecules will be cleaved off of the glycogen. So we call that process glycogenolysis. Again, glycogen is what we are working on. Lysis is to break down. So that term says we're breaking down the glycogen. And as we do that, we're just going to be picking off those individual links to our chain there, which are basically glucose molecules. Now, in some situations, right, we might need to make our own glucose. Okay, we need to make our own glucose. We've run out or something's gone on and we need glucose fast. Well, guess what? Again, 
We call them the liver because the liver is awesome. And what it'll do is it will make more glucose from non-carbohydrate sources. So what does that mean? It can make glucose from fatty acids. That's a non-carbohydrate source, all right? And so that process is called gluconeogenesis. Gluco is the glucose. Neo means new, and genesis means to create or make. So basically, we are making new glucose, okay? But in this situation, from a non-carbohydrate source, ketone bodies, all right, fatty acids, things that are not a sugar. And so here you can see, here's our glucose molecule. And so when we've got lots of it and we want to store it, we're going to engage in glycogenesis. And basically, we're going to just string all these individual glucose molecules to one another, and we'll form a glycogen molecule. So now comes the time, it's three, five in the morning, all right, we've run out of blood sugar, all right, not run out of it, but it's gotten real low, so we need to replenish it. So what will happen is we'll start to cleave off these individual glucose molecules or these monomers here through the process of glycogenolysis, and that occurs in the liver. Questions so far? Okay, so there's a couple other types of carbohydrates. We have our hexose monosaccharides. Well, what are those? Remember what I told you when we were talking about the glucose? These are the glucose isomers, galactose and fructose. All right, they're going to have the same chemical formula or molecular formula. Some other types of carbohydrates are our pento sugars. Those are the five carbo, excuse me, five carbon monosaccharides. Ribose and deoxyribose. We're going to come back and talk about these later on, but that has to do with RNA and DNA. Okay, we'll talk about that later. So we have our monosaccharides, which are, which are our simple sugars. Remember I was telling you, now we're going to take two simple sugars and we're going to put them together. We're going to bond them together. And so those are disaccharides. And there's three types that I want you to know. Table sugar, which is sucrose, all right? Milk sugar, which is lactose, and then maltose, which is malt sugar. Basically, what disaccharides are is going to be one molecule of glucose bonded to either another glucose molecule, or it's going to be bonded to galactose, or that glucose molecule will bond with a fructose. So, what happens now when we string a whole bunch? Of those monomers together, we get the polysaccharides. In animals, all right, that stored form of, of those polysaccharides is glycogen. In plants, starch. Also cellulose. But unfortunately, cellulose is, is hard to digest. And that is because of, if you've taken plant biology, uh, plant Plant cells have a cell wall. And for us, it's tough for us to break down that cell wall. All right, so that cellulose, we call it fiber. And again, it is pretty much non digestible. It's roughage. It's good to have, though. All right, so this, keep in mind that that plant starch, we utilize a lot of nutrition from plant starch. Okay, I am not a vegan. And for any of you that are, great on you. Um, but vegans are onto something because they are finding that there is quite a bit of um, good nutrition from plant sources. And not just uh, uh, carbohydrate nutrition, but uh, amino acid protein nutrition. All right, so here I'm just showing you a quick picture of those monosaccharides and those disaccharides. So again, here are the isomers to glucose. Here's galactose. You can see it's got a nice six carbon ring here. Fructose, right? It has six carbons, but this one carbon is kind of outside the ring here. And then ribose and deoxyribose. We'll talk about the pento sugars later on. So here are our disaccharides. Notice glucose, 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 and another glucose. So you're going to have at least one glucose in your disaccharides. 
So when you have two glucose molecules bonded together, you get maltose. When you get a glucose molecule bonded together with a fructose molecule, you get table sugar, sucrose. And then when you get glucose bonded to our galactose, that's your milk sugar, lactose. So you hear people say, I'm lactose intolerant. Well, guess what? You're having difficulty breaking this bond. <clears throat> and so you're missing an enzyme or you're in low supply of those enzymes. So what is the repeating monomer of glycogen? How do we build our long string uh, for the glycogen molecule? What is the monomer? What is that repeating molecule called? Anybody? I'm waiting for more people to respond. While you're thinking about that, when we do make our glycogen, where do we store it in the body? I told you there were two places. You're definitely going to see that again, either on your first test or on the final. Let's see what you folks put in. All right, yes, glucose is the monomer and it will be stored in the liver or skeletal muscle. Awesome, 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 awesome. Love it. Good job, folks. Great job. Okay glucose and then stored in the liver and skeletal muscles. Awesome. Oh, my favorite. I love proteins. Remember I told you we were going to come back and talk about uh, the, uh, the proteins here and uh, what their purpose is. Check it out. Remember I was saying when we talked about the denaturation of proteins, when the proteins in your body start to break down, look what's affected when proteins start to just break down because you're too acidic. Chemical reactions can not work because you are missing enzymes. Defense for your body, guess what? Antibodies, those are, those are proteins. So your antibodies start to break down. We're gonna talk about in chapter four about transport, how we move things in and out of a cell and actually inside the cell. So that gets all messed up, okay? When we're trying to build some of the support systems, the cytoskeleton for cells, that breaks down. Your muscles can have issues because the two uh, proteins that are made up uh, for muscle tissue, actin and myosin, those start to fall apart. And then storage and regulation. You can see all of these functions, catalyst, defense, transport, support, movement, regulation, storage, all right? All of those are performed by proteins. And so therefore, we do not want our proteins to become mismanaged and start to fall apart through a low pH, through that degradation. That's bad news, bad, bad news. All right, so if we're going to talk about proteins, let's start off by talking about protein monomers, the building blocks. The building blocks for proteins are what we call amino acids. You need to know that. So we're going to, similar to like glycogen, we just strung a bunch of, uh, of glucose molecules together to make glycogen. So we're going to make proteins. We're going to start to string along amino acids. And when we have more than 200 amino acids strung together, then we get a protein. So there's 20 different types of amino acids in our bodies. Okay, we break those down into essential and non-essential. Okay, so the non-essential, all right, the essential you need, and so your body doesn't make those, so you have to get those through your diet. But when we're looking at an amino acid, we're gonna see at the center of our amino acid is a carbon. And then on either side of the amino acid, you're gonna have an amine group, remember we were talking about those functional groups again, and a carboxyl group. I'll show you what that looks like. But both of those functional groups are attached to a carbon. And then off of the carbon, you'll have this little side chain, okay? And we call those R groups. And it's these R groups, which will be different from one different type of amino acid to another, that's how we're able to distinguish what type of amino acid we're looking at, all right, depending on what the R group is. 
So uh, let me just show you real fast. Here's what I'm talking about, okay? Here's the amino acid right here. So you can see we have the amine group here on the left side of our carbon, and then we have the carboxylic group here on the right side. And then coming off here on the bottom portion is our R group. We have 20 different R groups, all right, which will determine what type of amino acid we're looking at here. So that's one single amino acid. Now, when we start attaching amino acids to one another, we're going to create covalent bonds. And we give a special name to these types of bonds. You need to know this, peptide bonds. Okay, so when you stick two amino acids together, one amino acid is going to lose a hydrogen, and the other amino acid is going to lose a hydroxide group, an oxygen and a hydrogen. Well, because of that, the byproduct for that reaction is water. So we call that dehydration synthesis reaction. That's what we're seeing here in this picture. Here's one amino, uh, amino acid, here's the other amino acid over here. So here we can see, we're gonna cleave off this hydrogen ion off of our amine group, and then we're gonna cleave off this hydroxide molecule off of the carboxyl group, and they're gonna to come together and they're gonna form water. And so that bond that we're seeing between these two amino acids, all right, that bond is the peptide bond. So a peptide bond is a bond between two amino acids. Memorize that. So now what we're gonna do is we have a dipeptide. And so we're gonna just start adding amino acids onto our dipeptide molecule. And eventually we're gonna create a polymer, okay? And we're just gonna keep adding and adding and adding and adding. Eventually we'll stop. So one end, all right, of our protein, you're gonna see we'll have an amine group, all right? And because there's nitrogen there, we refer to that as the N terminal. And then on the other end, we're gonna have our carboxylic acid group, all right? So we got this nice C carbon molecule, so we'll call that the C terminal. And this makes this molecule polar, all right? The fact that we have an N terminal and a C terminal. So the N terminal is that free amine group on one end, and that C terminal is that free carboxyl group at the other end. And that's what we're seeing here in this drawing. Okay, so it's important that you know these terms because when you get to chapter 26, you're gonna learn about digestion, and you're gonna see when you take in a food product that is high in protein, we're going to start to break those proteins down into polypeptides, and then we'll break those polypeptides down into what we call illegal peptides. Then eventually we'll break those illegal peptides down into dipeptides or individual amino acids. That's basically what we're doing with digestion. It's called catabolism. We start with something big and we break it down into something small. And that's what we're going to see here. So when you have all right, a peptide string of amino acids, right? If it's between three to 20, it's an illegal peptide. If it's between 21 and 199, we call it a polypeptide. It has to be more than 200 amino acids for it to actually be a protein. Well, once we're 200 amino acids or more, it is an official protein. If it's not, it's gonna be a polypeptide, or an illegal peptide, dipeptide, or individual amino acids. That's simple. So we saw when we were talking about in the lipids, if we added a carbohydrate group to the lipid, we had a glycolipid. Well, same thing goes here with the proteins. If we add a carbohydrate group here to a protein, we get a glycoprotein. And these are important when we're talking about cell signaling, all right, especially when we're talking about our ABO blood typing groups, because that's what we're looking at. Those ABO blood typing groups are basically these glycoproteins that sit on the surface of our red blood cells. And they'll tell you if you're A, if you're blood type A, blood type B, or blood 
blood type AB or blood type O. And you get to learn about that in 211. See all the fun stuff you get, not that this isn't fun, but sometimes when I get on these topics, I wanna to just explain it all to you, but then we never get through our topic. And I know that we're getting close here to the end of class. We're almost done folks. So what are the monomers of proteins? What are the building blocks of our proteins? What do we, you heard me say it. And then I wanna know the name of the bond that occurs between these building blocks. We just learned it, okay? So we're gonna string these building blocks together once we get 200 of, or, or excuse me, more than 200 of whatever these building blocks are called, then we get a protein. And then the bonds in between these building blocks or these monomers, what do we call that bond? I got two people. <laughs> two people have answered me. Don't make me sad, make me happy. It's okay if you get the uh, incorrect answer. Because you get it on here, you won't miss it on the test, I promise you. Well, I can't promise you because I'm, I'm not taking your test. You are. Okay, let's check it out and see what we got. All right, so what is the monomer? Amino acids. And how do we bond them to one another? Through peptide bonds. Let's look at, yep, amino acids. Yes, 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 amino acids. Amino acids and peptide bonds. Very good, very good. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. Good job, everybody. Peptide bonds, hoorah. All right, last but not least, let's talk about our amino acids here. Well, actually, this is not the last part. Okay, real quick, real quick. All right, you remember me talking about those R groups, all right? And so those R groups are gonna confer the different types of groups that we're gonna categorize our amino acids. So we have a couple different categories, okay? So if our R group has, all right, hydrogen or hydrocarbons in it, all right, then these amino acids, all right, will actually um, interact with nonpolar amino acids, and we'll have our hydrophobic or water fearing, right? Nonpolar amino acids will be water insoluble. Our polar amino acids, all right, will have, all right, other elements other than hydrogen or hydrocarbons, okay? Could have a nitrogen in there, okay? Different, uh, have sulfur, okay? These guys, will be polar, so they will be water soluble and they can interact with water. Charged amino acids, the R group is either gonna have a negative or a positive charge, all right? This will also make those amino acids hydrophilic, water loving, so they'll be water soluble. So they can form these beautiful ionic bonds. You're familiar with those, remember opposites attract, opposites attract. And then we got a couple special amino acids, proline, cysteine, and methionine. Methionine, if you're getting into the genetic component, this is always the very first amino acid that gets made during protein synthesis. Every single protein, it's what we call the start codon, right? That's the start signal when we're making proteins, all right? Cysteine is nice because it can create a disulfide bond, all right? That's going to be a bond between two sulfur. And then proline here, you know, remember we talked about how you'll have these change, these uh, uh, chains in these molecules. Well, this amino acid has a slight bend in its protein chain. So you can see it here. Here's the proline, there's that slight bend there. Okay, and then this guy right here, here's cysteine, there's that sulfide, disulfide bond right there. All right, last part, all right, nucleic acids. Remember we were talking about the pento sugars, all right, ribose and deoxyribose. Well, we're gonna talk about nucleic acids. First of all, when we're discussing nucleic acids, this is largely important. These are the guys that are gonna store and transfer your genetic information, all right? So when we're talking about the two types, there's DNA and RNA. DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. RNA is ribonucleic acid. 
All right? So that is going to be your genetic code. All right, that's found inside of your nucleus, inside of each cell. So each cell basically has your entire genetic code right there. So if all of you was destroyed, but one single cell remained and we had the technology to replicate that, we could remake you from one single cell. And that's what they based their whole uh, Jurassic Park uh, uh, storyline on. All right, that DNA coding there. So DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, is double-stranded. And we're going to find it, all right, on the chromosomes. These are the structures that hold on to your, your genes, your genetic makeup. It's going to be found inside the nucleus and the mitochondria. Chapter four, we'll talk about what the nucleus and the mitochondria are. Nucleus is like the control center. The mitochondria is going to be like the powerhouse of the cell. It makes energy for your cell. And then ribonucleic acid, RNA, will also find that inside of the nucleus but we'll also find it outside of the nucleus, but still inside of the cell in the cytoplasm, all right? And we'll talk, again, when we get to chapter four, we'll talk about it, but the cytoplasm is like the goo that's outside the nucleus, but inside uh, the cell. All right, so when we're talking about these nucleic acids, these building blocks, all right, we are gonna discuss the term nucleotide. So what is a nucleotide? When we're making these nucleic acids, the building blocks for these nucleic acids are nucleotides. And so each nucleotide is made up of a sugar molecule. We saw that, ribose and deoxyribose, a phosphate, and a nitrogenous base. So this is when we get into the genomic sequencing and whatnot, when we're talking about um, the different nitrogenous bases. All right, so for this course and this, this class, I'm going to keep it simple. There are five nitrogenous bases. All right, five. The first two that I'm going to mention to you are adenine and guanine, and those are called purines. They have a double ring. Both of those molecules have a double ring. The other three, thiamine, cytosine, and uracil, those are called pyrimidines and those have one ring, okay? So we're going to uh, look briefly, all right, at this one specific nucleic acid, and then we're done, all right? I just wanted you to have the base. I'm not gonna go into the, a lot of the detail. If you're gonna, you wanna get more into this stuff here, this is a genetics course, okay? And I could talk for a long time on it, and I actually like genetics, all right? But again, because of time, I'm not going to. So the nucleic acid that I want you to, to, to own, to understand, is going to be adenosine triphosphate, ATP. ATP. It is this molecule that has to do with energy transfer within cells. What does that mean? So I need a molecule, this one here in particular, in order to do certain things in the cell. If I wanna make proteins, if I want to break something down, I need this molecule. This molecule is gonna allow me to transfer energy from the molecule, all right, to whatever it is I am going to do that I need that energy for. So adenosine triphosphate or ATP is made up of, all right, a nitrogenous base of adenine and then our sugar, and then this one has three phosphate groups. And the last two phosphate groups are bound to one another through covalent bonds. And when these bonds are broken, this is how we release the energy for whatever we need that energy for. If I need it for a chemical reaction, if I need it to make something, okay? So I'm gonna bust that bond. Let me show you, last part right here. So here is our molecule, all right? Here's the nitrogenous base, adenine with our sugar, okay? So here is the adenine, our sugar, but this is really what I want to uh, point to is the triphosphate group. See, one, two, three phosphates. This bond and this bond have tons of energy. When we snap this bond, it releases energy for whatever we need it for. 
And so this phosphate group just goes away. So then we call this molecule, we don't call it um, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, because we only have two phosphates. So we call it adenosine diphosphate, right? Saying that we have two phosphates. Then if we need to, we can snap this bond. And then this phosphate goes away. When we snap this bond, it releases energy. And so now we're left with one phosphate. So then our molecule is now termed adenosine monophosphate. And we can take that molecule, we can add another phosphate to it, turn it back into uh, ADP. And then if we add another molecule to the AD, another phosphate molecule to the ADP, then we can get another ATP. And that's what will happen. We'll re we like to recycle that. So we'll add these bonds back on through other processes, which we're not going to talk about right now. Okay, um, let me stop here. That's the last slide, I believe. Yes. Um, if there are questions, save them for lab. Let's take a break. I went over a little bit. So let's take about a 10, 15 minute break real quick. Um, grab something to eat or just rest your brains for a few moments. And then we'll come back and talk about the tissues. All right. I'll see you in a few moments.